Right now, I'm in my apartment on the third floor and I can't go outside. I'm lucky that I've just bought my groceries yesterday. I don't know who could have done that, but at this time, I know a few other things. I know that it was someone from the tenant since the seams in the door indicate that they were welded shut from the inside. I know that one of my neighbor's friends from the next entrance confirmed that their door was welded shut as well, which tells me that they are still in here with us. I know that we don't know who it is. Nobody has taken the blame so far. And I know that there's a dead body outside. But don't let me get too ahead of myself. I'll explain everything in a minute. I live in a small and very old apartment complex on the far outskirts of a small town. Honestly, calling it an apartment complex is a stretch. It's only five stories high, no elevator, and it was built out of concrete panels all the way back in the 60s. It has no attic, so people who live on the last floor have to constantly worry about rain ruining their ceilings. Extremely sound conducive for their thickness of wall so you never feel home alone. And a basement which connects to a sewer system, which smells horribly in the spring. In Russia, these kinds of buildings are called Khrushchevka, named after Khrushchev, obviously. I get the appeal of a low-cost, easy-to-construct building, but I think there's not a single soul in the entire country who would miss them. In 50 years, they should have demolished them or replaced them with something better, something newer. At this point, the buildings are a health hazard. Usually only the older people live there, since it was the house they had received long ago and they never moved out. Young people like me rarely moved into Khrushchevkas, which is why my neighbors were mostly old people. And let me tell you, old people in Russia are pretty mean. But I can't complain. I got this apartment from my late grandma, so at a young age, I at least had my own place. Plus the view from my balcony on the third floor is great. It overlooks the forest, which technically is the border of our town, so no ugly buildings in sight. Just a boundless nature which, as I was told, stretches for thousands of kilometers in that direction. An entire ocean of dark wood that curves beyond the horizon. In a way, I live on a beach. It's pretty sweet if you don't account for the things that sometimes wash ashore. At first, I was kind of bewildered. I went down the stairs to the first floor, yawning and stretching and hoping for a weekend to come faster, and I saw a crowd of people, all in their coats, with their bags in their hands. The air was hot and damp from their collective breathing, and the air was quaking from their shouting. I couldn't make out what they were saying, because they were all talking at the same time, but I could get the general mood. Some of them were confused, but mostly they were outraged. I didn't understand what was going on at first. It was 8 in the morning when everyone was either hurrying to their jobs or God knows where the pensioners go so early. But then I made it to the front of the crowd and my eyebrows shot up. In front of me, a couple of men in their 40s were trying their hardest to push the door open, only they couldn't. The entire frame of the iron door was welded shut. I could see the metallic seam running along the frame. Push harder, I have a doctor's appointment in an hour. One of the old women shouted at them. It's no use. One of the men stood back and wiped the sweat from his forehead. The seam had already cooled down. Nothing short of a circular saw will open this door now. We're locked in here? One of the women asked in a tone that was bordering on hysterical. I can't stay here. I need to get to work. Everybody needs to get to work. The man snapped back at her. But the door is locked. What else do you want me to do? So what? We're going to stay here locked because of some kid's prank. She squealed at a frequency I thought was impossible for a human voice to produce. I doubt that it was a prank, the man said. I've worked as a welder for 17 years, so I can tell you for sure. The door was welded shut from the inside. There was a pause of silence as everyone considered the meaning of his words. Somebody had locked themselves in with the rest of the tenants. But why? 
Who the hell would do something like that? I asked aloud to no one in particular. Some maniac for sure. The old woman grunted. She gave me a mean eye and then tugged my sleeve. Say, what apartment are you from? I don't recall seeing you here. Is that you who's done that? She pointed at the door. You and your good-for-nothing friends, huh? Probably open to butcher us all and take our money, right? She was getting louder with each sentence, and I suddenly found myself at the center of attention of a really mean and annoyed crowd. I had to defuse the situation fast, or else I wouldn't be able to reach my apartment in one piece. I'm Tamara Vasilvina's grandson, I explained, feeling angry that my words, the god honest truth, sounded like an excuse in that context. I've lived here for the past year, and I just came down from my apartment. Leave him be, you old hag. One of the men from the back of the crowd interfered. I've seen this lad here many times. He's good people. Helped you with my bags more than once. The woman was obviously humiliated by such a development and gave me a death glare. But thankfully, she didn't say anything else. A doorbell buzzed behind me. Someone from the crowd was trying to reach the neighbors that lived on the first floor. Open up! I heard a man's voice shouting, followed by the thuds of his fist knocking on the door. The door is stuck and I need to get to work. How are they going to help you? Someone from the crowd asked. I'll crawl out through the window, that's how, the man replied. Don't be ridiculous. All the windows on the first floor are grated, somebody else shouted, but the man didn't listen. It seemed that more people joined him as I could hear numerous fists banging on the door. Hello, can you help me with the door? I can't seem to open it. We suddenly heard a voice coming from outside, from beneath the welded door. Somebody was caught outside when the door was welded shut. I can't find any explanation as to why they were trying to enter our building at such an early hour. Perhaps they were out for groceries, or they decided to take a morning jog. Uh, perhaps it was a postman. It doesn't matter now. The people started talking all at the same time, trying to explain their situation to the man, or to ask him to call for help, or to demand him to explain himself. But he never had a chance to answer their questions. My god, what is it? He screamed in terror. The door shook as he started pulling on the door handle, hoping to pry the door open. The crowd fell silent. The terror in the man's voice was so genuine that no one had any doubts that he indeed saw something horrifying. Let me in, please! He screamed again, desperately hoping to muster the strength to open the door. We couldn't see, of course, what scared him so much, but we could hear it. The heavy snarling, the clanking teeth of a huge maw, the claws scratching against the ground, getting louder with each second. The concern for his fate swept over us at the same time. It was probably what our ancestors had felt when they watched one of their own being chased by a lion. Run! Run while you still can! The crowd shouted, but it was already too late. There was a loud thud and the door shook. The unknown creature rammed straight into the man, pressing him into the door with its massive frame. I could hear it growling as it was tearing into him, trying to get a better hold of him, but I couldn't recognize the animal. The door trembled again and again, as the creature was throwing the man against it, hoping to get him to stop resisting. He screamed until the creature finally got to his throat. Someone gasped in terror. Help him, someone! Somebody from the back of the crowd shouted. Nobody moved. There was nothing that we could do. The iron door that protected us from the creature outside was also separating us from the man. He was so close to us, and yet he was dying alone. There was another strike at the door, and the crowd stepped back. The creature was testing the metal. It could hear us inside, but the door stood still. Whoever had welded it shut did a good job. After that, it fell silent. We didn't know whether it left or if it was standing right behind the door, biding its time. We couldn't check either way. 
It was at that moment that we heard them. The sirens, old and rusty. They were coming back to life after decades of sleep to fulfill their purpose, to warn people of an incoming catastrophe. The years of slumber did not do them any good. They started out sounding low, but with each second, as their mechanical voice cords were stretching and warming up, they were getting louder and higher, until the familiar sound that everybody had hoped to never hear was drowning out everything else. The sirens were getting louder, but in the pauses between the pulses, I could hear that the noise of the town outside was getting quieter. After a few minutes, the commotion outside was gone as everyone evacuated. We were left alone, probably the only people in the entire district. Alone, stranded, with something dangerous roaming beneath our windows. I can hear howls and screams in the distance. Its voice sounds almost human, but I now know the difference. You could tell it clearly when its howl was followed by a human scream. Now you might think that there is panic among the tenants, but you would be wrong. A distinctive feature of Russian people is that they, more than anyone else in the world, just don't care. I say this with absolute certainty. Once they learn that the police told them to stay put, they just calm down. I can sort of see their reasoning. Why panic when you're protected by the walls? Can't you stay at home for a few days? The police told us that it's dangerous outside, so why would you go there? I've lived through the 90s, you wet-eared mutt. You think this is going to scare me? So while everyone was displeased, they decided to stay put. And well, if they don't want to go then, I don't have much of a choice either. I'd rather stay in our fort with the majority of people, even if they aren't the most pleasant company, than risk going out. Besides, it's not like there's any immediate threat to my life. Right? I'm still here. Still alive, so that's good. Still locked in, and I'm starting to doubt whether I'm as protected as I thought I am. Today was the day when we were planning to try to leave this place. But with everything that had happened, I don't think we'll be leaving anytime soon. The water and electricity are still working, which is surprising. It might be that not the whole town has been evacuated, or that there's some skeleton crew left to take care of the necessities. Just to be prepared for everything, I filled the bathtub with water, in case it stops running or something happens to the pipes. I'm also eating only perishable goods for now. The rest can wait. I guess that I'll clear out the refrigerator first and switch to grains and potatoes afterward. The phones aren't working anymore, and neither is the internet without the VPN. I guess it would be smarter to turn it off completely, but someone at the local ISP's office is either not very smart, or has left this window of opportunity for people like me. On the day that it all started, everyone in the building had been trying to contact the police. I remember on the first day that you could hear them all through the walls, cursing that they didn't pick up the phone, or begging to come help us when someone did pick up. At first, the policemen were seemingly shocked that when they learned that we were still here, but they told us how it was. Nobody was coming to rescue us. It would all be over very soon. We just had to stay put. When people started calling their relatives, the phones were suddenly switched off and had stayed silent since then. So I guess the higher-ups didn't want us to spread panic. Perhaps the rest of the country is not even aware of what's going on here. I'm not surprised. Our leaders have a long history of keeping the catastrophes under wraps. The beast has been very active on the first day. Though I hadn't seen it, I had heard later from the rumors that one of the tenants had seen it lurking beneath his windows. We would occasionally hear its roars and screeches, and every time I could hear the entire building fall silent to hone in on its sounds and determine how far away it is. We couldn't hear it on Saturday. Only a few car alarms had been set off, implying that something still lurks there. And on Sunday, for now, let's just say that we didn't see him during the day. All of this had led people to believe that this whole thing was going to be over soon. 
Although on the first day, everyone was staying in their apartments. On the second day, people started going out. People were walking up and down on the stairwell, talking to each other, and even inviting their neighbors in for a dinner. I had never seen these people getting so social. Usually, they just give you a dust stare. I could hear the clanking of plates and cups, a whistling of kettles, and chitter of the tenants as they were gathering into groups. I can understand them. Even the soldiers on the front lines of World War II had reported how unbearable the boredom was when nothing was happening. Plus, it's been instilled into us to stick together in times of hardship by the very nature. So realizing that it wasn't a good idea to spend my days alone, I decided to pay a visit to the only friend that I had within these walls, Nikita, who lived on the fifth floor. We had been buddies since the day that I moved in. He noticed me when I was entering my apartment and he invited me in for some tea. He was a swell guy around my age and was a casual tabletop gamer. We had spent many evenings playing Monopoly and Jackal in the past with him and his girlfriend. It was her who opened the door, and I instantly recognized from her look on her face that something was very wrong. Nikita was staying at his friend's home the night before it all started. Natasha explained. He was supposed to come home in the morning. We took a day off for Friday, and we were supposed to go out of town. But he didn't make it in time. She didn't cry, though looking at her eyes I realized that she already had for many hours. I could tell that she could use my support. So I invited myself in. Over a cup of tea, she shared with me that she was feeling scared for him. She was afraid that he was close to the building when the sirens started wailing, and that she had nightmares where black hands were dragging him into darkness. She shared with me that she had heard that someone couldn't get in on Friday morning, and that she was afraid that it was him, so I reassured her that it wasn't the case. As I was there, I had heard the victim's voice and I would be able to tell if it was Nikita. That brought her some relief, but still she was stressed. I can't sleep very well since then, she told me. I wake up in the night hearing footsteps above. I keep hoping that it's him, but I know that it's not the case. On my way back from Natasha, I met the man who had claimed that he was a professional welder. He was carrying a box of tea to his neighbors. Curiosity got the best of me, so I struck up a conversation with him hoping to learn if something about those welds could tell him something about the water. It's all over the place, he informed me. The welds are mostly fine, so I can tell that whoever did that knew what he was doing. But they are really messed up on other spots, especially at the corners. And there is a lot of slug left. Whoever did it was probably in a hurry and drunk. His hands seemed to be trembling. I can't stop thinking about it. The perpetrator is somewhere in this building, I know it. There are four separate flights of stairs, five floors, four apartments are each floor grouped around a stairwell. So, 80 apartments in total. If I went by elimination, I would be able to find him eventually. It's not like I have anything better to do at the moment. I've spent a good hour examining the door, trying to spot some clues. All I've found is a cigarette butt that may not even belong to him. A Russian brand. So use Apollo. It's really nasty stuff. Makes you cough your lungs out. I might take a look at the pain cans mounted on each flight of stairs. The improvised ashtrays. Maybe I'll find something this way. Some people just don't have the luxury to kick back and pursue some personal quest like I do. They generally need to get out. An old man in his early 60s knocked on my door. He was looking for insulin. He had been planning to get it from the nearby drugstore in the morning that we were all locked in. During the last few days, he had used up his last reserves and now desperately needed more. He had said that he had hoped that it would all be over before that would happen, but time was playing against him, and now he had no choice but to ask people to share their own if they had any. I didn't, but wondered if any other tenants had, but were choosing to hide that in fact in order to save some for themselves. 
When I noted that I hadn't seen his face before, he informed me that he was from the next flight of stairs. He had to get up onto the roof to come over here when all of his neighbors told him that they didn't have any insulin on them. I had heard that there had been shortages of insulin in the drugstores lately, which was probably why the old man didn't have enough stock on him. The drugstore is just across the road from our building, he complained to me. I can see it from my window. They were supposed to bring in a new batch on Friday morning, but when I came downstairs, the door had already been welded shut. His last sentence intrigued me, so I asked how early that he tried to leave the building. It was 6 a.m., son, he informed me. The pharmacist told me that the truck with insulin was going to arrive at 9 a.m., but I thought that I might get in the line early to make sure that I get enough. This has left me very heartbroken, but it also gave me a clue. The perpetrator must have finished what he was doing before his 6 a.m., and if that old man in need of insulin was able to get up onto the roof, surely the mysterious perpetrator could do the same. That would allow him to weld all of the doors shut from within. Perhaps it was even him who was waking up Natasha at night, or maybe someone else. I didn't want to jump to the most horrible conclusion right away. If something was crawling on the roof, it wouldn't miss its chance to go inside the building. Unless it's already here, hiding in one of the apartments. There were talks that we could make a break for it, make a rope out of bed sheets, hang it from the window, and then get down from the second floor's window, one by one, and then head to the other side of town. We were acting like a group. Today was the day that we were going to set this plan into motion, but it didn't come to be. Last night, I woke from a sudden sound. When I opened my eyes, it was already over, but I knew what I had heard. The scream, the howl, similar to the one that the beast produced, only somewhat different. I lay in the dark with my eyes open, waiting for it to repeat, but there was only silence. I heard footsteps above. It seemed that I wasn't the only one who had been woken up by it. Getting up to my feet, I glanced at my phone. It was 3 a.m. I tried going back to sleep, but I couldn't keep my eyes closed. The howl, the implications of it were keeping me awake. Deciding that I'm not going to sleep anymore, I got up and I headed for the balcony. Oh, hey there. My neighbor Maxim startled me. His balcony was a few meters away from me, and he also decided to go out for a smoke. Even though it was a November night, he was wearing only his underpants. You heard that too. He pointed at the forest with his cigarette. I nodded. Yeah, you think it's back? And it didn't sound like it. Maxim confirmed my suspicions. It sounded different, you know, like a different breed or something. Yeah, I thought so too. You mind passing me one? I asked Maxim, and he threw me the entire pack. Take it, you might need all of them. Before taking a cigarette, I glanced at the pack. So you Sapalo. My curiosity spiked, but I quenched it. I didn't want to think about that at the moment. We smoked in silence for some time, and then Maxim spoke again. Everything's in chaos in this building. Everyone is scared. We ought to do something about it. Like what? I wondered. I don't know yet. Maxim shook his shoulders. But it's our responsibility as men, you get me? We have to. He fell silent as a branch broke somewhere below. Something was moving down there. I only looked in time to see something big entering the forest, and my blood ran cold. It was standing there throughout all of our conversations, and neither me nor Maxim had noticed it. We were merrily chatting as the beast below was biding its time, listening to our voices. Holy, have you seen it? Maxim loudly whispered. I, I didn't, I stuttered still shocked that the creature we had been hiding from for the last few days 
the one that had crushed a man's windpipe with its jaws, was a mere meters away from me. Hold on, I'll light it up. I searched my pockets for her phone, pulled it out, turned on the flashlight and pointed it at the forest. At the very next moment, I shuddered and dropped it, catching it at the very last moment. I was not ready to see something like that. The phone's flashlight was not particularly powerful, so the cone of light quickly dissipated. And yet some of the photons had found their way between the branches deep into the forest to reflect from the beast lone giant eye, the size of a small platter, and travel back to me. At that short moment, I was unwillingly participating in a staring contest with it. Something told me that I was the first man to do so and to walk away to tell about it. So now we know that it never left. It was always there, biding its time. It's not leaving, and neither are we. People are back to their apartments, and the stairwell is almost empty. On my way to Natasha, some old woman opened a door to give me a death stare. Why the heck are you stalking around here? Everybody is tense as it is. They don't need you creeping around here making noise. Today, Maxim knocked on my door. He told me that all the able men were organizing into militia, and they offered me to join him. I decided that it was best to agree. If all able men were grouping up, I would be wise to stick with them, even if it could mean that I would be the building's first line of defense. Plus, I'll be able to keep my eyes on Maxim. The beast has become more stealthy. We don't hear its roars anymore. But sometimes, after spending hours looking out the windows, I can see it lurking behind the branches in the forest. I'm convinced that it came from the forest now. It feels like at home there, spending the majority of its time there, surfacing only to take a glance at us, to check if we're still there. My fridge is already empty. Even with me rationing the food, it ran out much quicker than I had expected. Luckily, I still have my grains and potatoes. Most of the old people don't seem to be complaining. I can understand why. With them surviving on their pension, they had learned to stretch the food until the next month. Plus, they are old and their knees are weak and brittle. They can't afford to go out for groceries every day. So they wait until they learn about some sale somewhere, and then they go there to stock up for a month even if said sale is on the other side of the town. They're probably stocked up for a few months ahead, and I can't stop thinking about it. The tap water is starting to taste funny too. I'm glad I filled my bathtub to be ready for something like that. Some people are warning everyone not to drink it, and I hear all kinds of rumors as to why we shouldn't. From it having some drugs mixed into it, and to it being poisonous to take care of everyone, Personally, I don't think it's anything like that. The pipes had already gone bad over the last week since they weren't looked after. Maxim had started organizing the militia. So far, it's very small and we patrol only our flight of stairs and the roof. But he had started to try and convince people from the neighboring ones to join us as well. He sounds very convincing, and I can see why people are joining them. It gives them back the illusion of control. Even though we don't have anything except for some makeshift weapons, like sharpened brooms and knives or, in my case, a hatchet for meat, people are now less scared to leave their apartments again. They trust us. I guess it reminds them of the old times when volunteer militias on the streets that looked after the neighborhood were a common thing. However, not everyone is willing to join his cause. The furthest flight of stairs to the right gave us a rather cold shoulder when we descended from the roof to tell them about our idea. We were greeted by a bunch of men. Some of them were obviously drunkards, with their faces red and swollen from constant drinking, while the others had prison tattoos on them. All of them reeked of alcohol, and the sounds of Blotniak, a Russian music genre that consisted mostly of obscene ballads about criminal life, played in the background. Somewhere far in the distance, I had heard metal clanking. I didn't pay much attention to it then. 
Their leader, a man with gold teeth and a naked torso exposing a tattoo of an orthodox church, spat to the ground when he heard us out. I'm trying to play coppers here, he said with a fake grin, making sure to show us every tooth. <laughs> Look at that one, guys, he pointed at me. So young and already trash. The crowd behind him half-heartedly laughed. I felt a chill running down my spine. The look in their eyes was dangerous. It was like staring into the eye of the beast again. It's for the greater good, Maxim said, staring at the man. We're all in danger and we need to stick together. We can look after ourselves, the man replied, pulling a gun from behind his belt. For a moment. And we don't need anyone stupid around you either. Now scram back to your corner. I felt Maxim's hand on my shoulder. He was tugging at me, letting me know that it was time to go. I felt sick that the man could talk to us like that and get away with it, but there was nothing I could do. Hey, bring some girls next time. One of the men shouted as we were leaving, and the crowd laughed. Well, Maxim said on our way back, It seems like we have a hot of here. When he met my confused gaze, he explained, it's the place where the criminals gather after they have served their sentence to celebrate. It seems like a bunch of them got caught up in here with us, and they don't seem like it affected them. They seem to just be partying all day long, which means, soon, they'll be out of food. I don't envy their neighbors. Maxim is a nice guy. I'm still not sure if he's the mysterious Walter who had locked us all in. The only clue I have is the brand of cigarettes that he gave me and it's a stretch to think that he's the only one in the entire building who smokes them. While they are not exactly common, I had seen people smoke them plenty of times. I tried talking to him about what he thinks about the identity of the Walter. Who could it be and why did he do that? And while he was talking, I was looking at his face to spot something. If he were to get nervous then, it would be a dead giveaway. But his face remained straight the entire time and he even got some joy out of speculating about who it could be, and what their motives were. Either he was a very good liar, or it just wasn't him. After that, Maxim had me check the basement to see whether we could escape through the sewers, or if something could find its way through them. Truth be told, I was scared to go down there. The concrete walls covered in moss and cobwebs stretching from wall to wall weren't exactly reassuring. But what really scared me were the tiny windows along the walls. They were too small to crawl through. I would barely be able to fit my head in if I tried, but I was still afraid that something could find its way in. The basement ran under all of the building, with all flights having a door leading down there, so it was hard to find the hatch that led down to the sewers. When I finally found it in the corner of the basement, I experienced a mix of emotions. It was also welded shut, which meant that nothing could get in through it, but also that nothing could get out. Over the last few days, we had started hearing gunshots in the distance. It sounds like a machine gun, and I doubt anyone in our town has one. Maybe the police have a few AK-74s. Sometimes it almost sounds like there's a war going on in the distance. It fills me with hope that we're going to be rescued soon. But I can't help but wonder, what are they shooting at for so long? I doubted that the beast outside could soak in so much ammunition. Aside from that, not much happened during that time. One day followed another, and I spent the majority of my time with Natasha. We could both use some distraction from the world around us. I was at her apartment yesterday playing Monopoly, when we heard confused shouts coming from the outside. Looking out the window that was overlooking our town, I felt my heart skip a beat. Someone was running away from the house. I squinted my eyes and my heart sank even more. I recognized who that was. It was the old man who had been looking for insulin. I opened the window and looked down, already knowing what I was looking for. And sure enough, it was there. A rope made out of bedsheets, hanging from one of the windows on the second floor. In desperation, 
The man must have decided to make a break for it and rush towards the drugstore to get the insulin that he needed to survive. It was either that or a slow and painful death. He disappeared behind the crown of trees, and a few seconds later, I heard the glass break. He must have shattered the window of the drugstore to get inside. The sound echoed across the empty streets, and Natasha shuddered in fear. I knew what she was going through. If that creature that had stalked her house for the past week heard him, it would no doubt come over, seeking its next prey. A few minutes later, I saw him running towards the window, clutching something in his hand. Even from a distance, I could see how pale he was. He was out in the open, away from the safety of our walls. And for a moment, I felt respect for the man rise up in my chest. He defied his odds and refused to die doing nothing. He had approached the windows when we heard it. The moaning scream of the beast, somewhere very close. The man grabbed the rope and started climbing up. He made it about halfway when his weak arms gave out and he fell to the ground. Old and frail, he was unlikely to make it even if he wasn't malnourished and weakened by his disease. He slowly got up, rubbing his hip and tried climbing up again, when the creature showed its head around the corner. I could finally see it with my own eyes. It was beyond my wildest expectations. It was clear that, whatever it was, it was not from this world. Its front legs were thick and burly, ending with paws with long fingers that looked disturbingly similar to human fingers. The hind legs were much shorter and, once again parried in human nature, looked very similar to human legs. All of its body was covered in black long thick fur except for its head, which was bald, exposing its gray skin. Ended in the center of its almost human looking head, a single eye rotating wildly, seeking out its target. It stopped on the old man, and the beast let out a low growl. The man was not giving up, trying to crawl up, but with his busted hip, he could barely crawl one meter above the ground, and his arms along could not pull him up. The beast must have noticed that because it didn't rush at him. Instead, it took its time approaching him as if taunting the man's efforts to escape it. When it was just five meters away, the man jumped back to the ground and tried to escape, but the creature covered the distance separating them in one quick leap. It raised its paw above him, clenching its fingers into a fist, and I looked away, but I still heard the wet splatter when its fist descended onto the man's head like a hammer, taking care of him instantly. At least he didn't suffer like the one before him. When I carefully looked out again, the creature and the man were gone. The only proof that they had been there was a long trail leading around the corner, towards the forest. I thought that the day was eventful enough, but last night, something else happened. I woke up from the sound that had haunted me for so long, that I wanted to know so much about. The sound of someone welding something. I jumped out of my bed and listened. I wasn't sure where the sound was coming from, but when I looked out of the window, I noticed a light coming from the roof above, somewhere from the direction where the criminals resided. I rushed out of my apartment just in time to see Maxim leave his own. He was wearing nothing but boxers, and I could see in his eyes that he was in a rush. Just like me, he wanted to learn the identity of a mysterious Walter. When we got under the roof, the water was already gone, but not before finishing what he had been doing. The door leading down to the criminals was now reinforced with a makeshift cage gate made out of stairs railings. At that moment, I realized that the sound I had heard before, the clanking of metal, was probably the water working on the railings to give them the necessary shape. The mysterious water that I had been chasing for the past week was one step ahead of me. I now knew where he lived, and I couldn't get there. And even if I did find my way in, I'd have to deal with the criminals first. They'd let me know before that I was not welcome there. The burning question, however, was not who he was. What bugged me the most was, why did he do it? What made him install the gate in the door leading to the roof? Perhaps there was something that we didn't know about. 
I thought that would be as far as the bad news went. But this morning, we found one of the tenants dead on the stairwell. There were no wounds on his body, but he was foaming at the mouth, and his skin had the nastiest shade of purple. I recognized his face. It was the man who on the first day had said that he had worked as a welder in the past. His grieving wife told us that he had no history of heart diseases, which led us to a single conclusion. He was poisoned. It seemed that the tap water indeed contains poison in it. Since then, we don't drink tap water anymore. I'm also convinced that they have left us electricity to lure all the creatures to us. They want our problem, namely, the problem of having too many witnesses to take care of itself. Spread the message, people. We're here, and we're still alive. There's something outside my door. Something's lurking at the stairwell, going up and down all five floors. I was alerted to its presence by a scream one late evening. Someone must have gone out for a smoke and to maybe socialize with his acquaintances when they saw it. There are no sounds of struggle, nor any yelps of pain, only terror. I'm now glad that nature instilled that need to cry out when you're faced with something horrifying. Something so unexplainable, it rocks your understanding of the world around you. That way, you warn your pack about the danger. Even if you don't survive, the others learn to stay wary. Your death becomes a noble sacrifice. A meaningful event when you succumb to your terror in your last moments. And I barely managed to squeeze my own scream of terror in when I realized that the shriek the creature admitted was not the one that I had heard before. It was not the primal yell that had haunted us for the last week. This, this was something new. Something that somehow had managed to find its way into our apartment complex, despite the precautions that had been taken. I spent half an hour looking out the eye hole, trying to catch a glimpse of it. The dim light bulb outside provided just enough lighting to see what was going on. At one point, something suddenly obscured the light and I heard a pitter-patter across my door. A second of confusion was followed by a terrifying realization, and I jumped back from the door, trying to hold back my scream of surprise and shock. Whatever it was, it just crawled across my door on its many legs. It could crawl on the walls. This means that the door on the roof is now a huge opening in our defenses. In the morning, me and the other guys from our militia carefully stepped out to take a look at the damages it had done. We had found a bloody spot on the fourth floor, and a long trail of it which led to the roof. There, it led towards the edge of the roof where it ended. The creature not just found its way inside our house, it took one of ours and then dragged him off to its nest. Since there are two creatures now, I feel I should start giving them the names, Ape Demon or The Ape. It sounds like a fitting description for the one that has been terrorizing us for the last few days. And on the next day, everyone unanimously started calling the newcomer, The Crawler. So that's what we are going with now. So if The Ape is the juggernaut that watches the streets, The Crawler is the infiltrator that sneaks in and attacks us where we live. A demon ape and the crawler. God, just two weeks ago, I wouldn't have thought that those are the words that I would use with a serious face. Since that event, we put a lock on the door that leads to the roof. I think it was long overdue. It's just, we never thought that we would need to do that. I pray that it will suffice to keep it out, and I make sure to have my curtains closed at all times. I'd hate to one day look outside and see that thing crawl across my window, and I'd hate to see me inside. An easy prey, ready for consumption. I'm more and more concerned with what our endgame is. There is no chance that the water in the pipes could have gone so bad in just over a week, that it would become so toxic. Bacterias don't kill you in one night. They don't make you foam at your mouth, they don't make your skin turn purple. The water has some toxins in it now. Which tells me that, our government, we are no more than unwanted eyewitnesses. 
If we make it to the other part of town where the gunshots are heard, we won't be rescued. We will meet a firing squad. The food becomes a problem. Yesterday, I heard someone walking around, asking the neighbors if they have some salt. Just a cooking salt, to make their boring dish more pleasurable. I heard three of my neighbors tell them to get lost. But who am I to judge? When they rung my bell, I didn't open the door. Now, I know that it's just salt that they were looking for, but you can never be too careful. Perhaps it was their way of gauging the situation. Perhaps they think that if I have salt to spare, that I had plenty of other food inside, and that I'm a viable target. Perhaps I'm just talking nonsense. Two days ago, I carefully checked the door in the basement that led to the flight of stairs where the bandits live. It was locked on a hanging lock. But neither I nor any of the tenants heard the welding. Which means that, if anything, it could be broken down. I need to get to the welder. This personal quest of mine that started out of boredom and curiosity has grown into a necessity. And a prerequisite for my survival. They must know something. They are calling all the shots on where everybody goes. And what parts of the building that we have access to. And they might have the tools to get us all out of here. I've thought about it. My only chance of making it is getting a torch or a buzzsaw from him. Whichever he happens to have. Cut the hatch that leads to the sewers open and escape through it. It's probably a maze down there. So, if I make a wrong call on where to get out of it and come face to face with the military or the beast outside, I'm done for. But it's better than pushing my luck by trying to escape through the surface. The only problem is getting to him before the bandits he lives with get to us. The cage gate that he's installed on the roof entrance has latches on a lock, which means that it can be opened by them, which means that it is they who decide who enters their flight of stairs, which means that they pretty much have a fortress within the fortress. I fear that when those doors open, they'll come out not to cooperate, not to beg for food, but to hunt, to prey on the weak, and so far we have no solid way of fighting them back. But the crawler and the bandits aren't our only problems. Yesterday, the ape learned that it's strong enough to rip the cages out the windows on the first floor. Worse, it was the apartment in the same stairwell as mine that it chose to attack. I heard its grunts outside, the screams of terrified people downstairs, the weepy metal that was being torn apart. I don't know what the people downstairs did to provoke the beast. Perhaps they had thought that the cages would protect them, and they didn't have their curtains closed. Perhaps they saw the creature and decided to indulge themselves in a staring contest with it. I don't know, I didn't ask. One of the tenants who had lived there managed to escape. I could see the terror in her eyes when I walked out of my apartment to see what was going on, just in time to have her rush past me, but I knew that someone else was less lucky. I heard the screams of a man who the ape pinned down. I heard the loud thumps when its fist collided with the man's flesh. And you know that thing where you can tell where the sound is coming from by how much it is distorted by the echo? Well, judging by how it all sounded, I realized with terror that these screams were coming from that apartment on the first floor. And that the woman, fleeing in terror, didn't close the door on her way out. Which meant that, when the ape was done with the man downstairs, it would be free to enter the stairwell and roam all five floors. Perhaps it wouldn't even be able to leave if it got lost here. I had to do something quick. It was very risky to go down there and try to close the door. But I knew that if I didn't, that at that moment I would be dead within a few days. It wasn't bravery that pushed me to do such a reckless action. It was desperation. I was facing a paradox. Stay safe and die or risk your life and live. And my body was telling me that I wanted to live some more. I carefully made my way down to the first floor and I took a peek at the door. Just as I suspected, it was wide open. I could hear the ape munching on its already silent prey, but I could also see the key already in the keyhole. Carefully, trying my best not to make a noise, I inched towards the door. 
I wanted to scream in terror from the fact that my steps weren't completely soundless. But I guess the creature didn't hear it over the sound of the bones that breaking under its bite. I was now right next to the door. One more step and I would be inside the apartment. The ape was now mere meters away from me. Somewhere around the corner. If I messed up, I would have a second, maybe two to say my prayers. There was no going back now. Carefully, I slid the key out of its keyhole. On its way out, it clanked. The munching stopped. It took a step. I slammed the door shut and started shoving the key into the keyhole, but my trembling hands couldn't pull that off. A muffled roar came from within the apartment, and I felt a massive body slam into the door from the other side. Luckily, the door seemed to be reinforced. The ex-tenants had made sure to protect themselves from burglars, as with them living on the first floor, they were the prime targets. My legs were twitching from all the adrenaline in them, begging me to run away. I knew that if the creature somehow turned the door's handle, even by accident, it would break out that instant, leaving me no chances to survive. I took a pause, took a deep breath, and then slipped the key in. A moment later, I turned it, locking the door. The beast was now subdued. It left the apartment through the window a few hours later, after it was done raging and consuming the man. After that, all the tenants who lived on the first floor moved in with their neighbors above. They brought their food supplies with them, and I'm glad to say that people upstairs didn't mind them. They realized that it would be heartless to let them live on the first floor, or hang out on the stairwell, where they were the easy prey. Natasha had an old man move in with her as well. But still, even though our casualties were minimal, we had taken a huge hit. Our home, our submarine submerged in all this madness, had taken another hit and sunk even deeper. I'm currently thinking about how to find the welder and get him out of here without alerting any thugs. The roof is not an option, but there's still a basement door that can be broken. I'll discuss that with Maxim tomorrow. It's time to act. Time to get out of here. It's really weird how everything is both extremely tense and dull here. My life is in constant danger and we don't have a solid plan yet. But I can't think about it all the time. As weird as it sounds. I'm tired of constantly thinking about my chances of survival. And when monsters are not crawling across your window, you don't have that sense of urgency. You don't get anything at all. It feels like you exist only to react to them, interact with them, and maybe eventually end up as their lunch. Over the past few days, I've received a lot of advice from Florida. You guys have it rough there. I still wish that. I would rather be there, though. At least it has colors. Everything here is so gray that I want to poke my eyes out. We prepared for food and water shortages, but there were things that we didn't consider. For starters, there are two dead bodies in our building, and they're starting to rot. When the guy who got poisoned died, his widow kept his body in their apartment. She dressed him up in nice clothes and laid him down on their sofa. We even suspect that she spent some water to wash his body. But two days ago, she came to us asking for help. He was starting to swell up and smell. It was a weird sight, seeing him lying there in a tranquil pose, arms on his chest, on that tiny sofa under a painting of a river, yet so swollen and purple. It seemed that the toxin continued its work in him. The smell was unbearable. In the first few minutes that I've got there, it was making me want to vomit, and knowing that it was a human body, something that was a living individual just some time ago, was making it even more disturbing. She wanted us to take him to the basement, but Maxim objected. His smell will attract the predators. They'll want to break in even more if they smell his stench. We need to throw him outside or leave him on the roof. You can't. She whispered, her eyes widened. It's not Christian-like. He deserves a burial. She left her husband's carcass and raised her hands, letting everyone know that she won't let us take him. You can't! She repeated in a shrill voice. I won't let you. 
Get out of here. I won't let you do it to him. We silently surrounded her. Nobody wanted to force her away, but we knew that it had to be done. The man's dead body was compromising the safety of the living. Maxim wordlessly grabbed her by the wrist. She screamed and tried to break free, but Maxim wouldn't budge. When she realized that she couldn't overpower him, she had switched to defense, clawing at him with her free hand. Maxim didn't defend himself, choosing to stoically endure her assault, giving her the opportunity to take it all out on him, and only tilting his head back so that she couldn't claw his eyes out. Take the body, throw it out the window, he said before dragging the woman to the kitchen so that she wouldn't get in her way. In a desperate, last-ditch attempt to resist, she grabbed onto the door, but Maxim yanked her away from it. Her grip was strong enough to leave scratches on the door's wooden surface, and one of her nails was left edged into it. We wrapped his body in a blanket. It was easier to carry him that way, both physically and mentally. We had carried him to the roof. One of us said some prayers and we tossed him over the edge. We didn't even look how he fell, only hearing the heavy thud when his body collided with the ground and rushed to safety before the crawler showed up. Looking back, I don't feel guilty about what we did, but I feel guilty for not feeling guilty, if that makes sense. I should have felt something. A few hours later when I looked out of the window, the body was already gone. The second body, the one of the men who got mauled in his apartment, was left where it was. We knew that the door to the apartment could off the intruders, so we didn't bother to do anything about it. I've talked to Maxim about the water and my plans to get to his tools. He liked my idea, but he warned me that there was nothing we could do at the moment. Sneaking in would be dangerous and we didn't know where to look. It's dangerous to confront them, he told me. They are armed and they can overreact to us entering their territory. Maybe we should just let them know about our plan. That way they will cooperate. I reluctantly agreed with them. Back then, we didn't know that the time for negotiation was already up. That those scumbags had already made up their mind. Because yesterday, when I walked up to the fifth floor to waste some time with Natasha, I found to my horror that the door to her apartment was wide open, and there were signs of struggle taking place in her hallway. I had suspected the worst, but also, I didn't abandon the hope. I rushed through all of the rooms, but she was nowhere to be found. Only the old man from the first floor that she had taken in was lying on the floor of the guest room. A small pool of blood formed under his left side. He was still alive when I turned him over. He didn't answer my questions as to where Natasha was, instead just whispering, I'm sorry young man, it's all our fault, the sins of the fathers. I didn't have time to heed his cryptic words. I needed to help him or he would die from bleeding, but I knew that Natasha was in danger at that very moment, perhaps somewhere very close. I rushed back to the hallway, trying to find any clue as to where she could be, and sure enough, there were a few drops of blood on the floor, leading outside and towards the door to the roof. It was dangerous to enter the roof on my own, but I didn't care. I rushed outside, looking around. Nothing. Nothing but a small, barely noticeable trail of droplets. I feared that it would lead me to the edge of the roof, but instead, it was heading towards the cage door at the end of it, the one that led to the bandit's hideout. The cage was already locked. I started shaking it and screaming for them to let Natasha go. It's reckless of me, I know. If I had stayed there for a few more minutes, I had no doubt attract the crawler and be done with. But one of the bandits emerged from the darkness beyond the cage and shook his pistol at me. Keep it civil. Your girlfriend is in good hands. We'll take care of her. After all, how does that saying go? If you love her, let her go. Ain't that right? He gloated. I spat in his face. And when he lifted his gun, I turned around and ran away. I heard a few shots behind me, but luckily they had missed me and the man must have decided not to spend more ammo on me. I had to act quick. I didn't even want to think about what they were going to do with her. 
every minute counted. As I was running down the stairs, calling for men to gather up, hollering at the top of my lungs. Surprisingly, people started leaving their apartments to see what was going on. They could hear the urgency in my voice and they didn't want to miss an important announcement. Never had I been so glad to see the faces of my neighbors before. Just two minutes later, I had told them what had happened. Two women rushed to the fifth floor to help the old man. Some militia you are, some old woman from the back row said. You can't even protect us in our homes. Shove it! I yelled in her direction, and surprisingly, there were no witty retorts. Hey kiddo, what's going on? Maxim stepped through the crowd to see what was happening. I told him what was up. His eyes turned bloodshot, and his fist trembled with fury. Those, uh, that settles it, he hollered. Men, gather up. We're going to take her back. He confidently hurried towards the roof. I followed, and I could see that other men, even those who were reluctant, followed after us. We headed straight to the door on the roof. The same door where, just a few minutes before, I had almost been shot. Only now, I wasn't alone. There were at least ten men with me now. It didn't matter if we probably couldn't break through the gates. What mattered was that, when ten angry men show up at your doorstep, you listen to what they have to say. Open up! Maxim shot it through the cage grates. Open up or I swear I'm going to break these down. What's all the ruckus? The same man who I had seen previously began to walk up to the cage. He cast me an angry gaze before looking away. While he looked confident, his earlier smugness was gone. Give us back the girl or we'll feed you to those monsters outside. Maxim hollered. The bandit raised his hands in a mocking gesture of fear. Easy, Pops. We just took a girl for a night out. No harm in that, right? Maxim kicked the cage in fury and the man on the other side had jumped in surprise. It was now clear that he was feeling tense and his calmness was just an act. Now, if you think that we can't tear these down, you're very mistaken. Maxim shouted. Calm down, Pops. I was just joking, okay? We could all use a bit of humor these days. The man said, doing his best to keep smiling. I'll go look for her. He disappeared. I was getting more and more anxious. Who knew for how long she had been in there? Who knew what they had been doing to her? Every minute counted. We heard some arguing coming from within. The men were shouting at each other, but due to the echo, I couldn't make out what they were saying. Thankfully, I didn't hear Natasha's screams. The shouting subsided, and then a few minutes later, the man walked up to the cage separating us. I could see Natasha behind him. She had a nasty bruise under her eye, and dried up blood on her lip indicated that she must have been bleeding from her nose. Thankfully, her clothes were intact, with no signs of terror, and there was a strange spark in her eyes that seemed almost out of place. A spark of enthusiasm and determination. Here's your girl, the man grunted, giving her a push towards us as she was passing him. We didn't do much to her, see? Now scram. And her food, Maxim inquired. What are you talking about? It was a down payment for keeping her safe with us. It was the man's reply and he closed the gate and walked away. Maxim grunted and I could see the fury in his eyes. To him, it wasn't over. He wasn't going to let it slide. Something unknown in the distance roared. We hurried back to safety. Uh, how are they? Did they... I asked Natasha once we were inside the building. But she raised her hand to stop me. I'm fine. Don't worry about it. The leader got scared when he saw that jerk bring me to them. He suspected something like this would happen. How did they get you? I asked her another question, but she shook her head. They lured me out, pretended to be one of the tenants from the next flight of stairs, told me that they were looking for some aspirin. It doesn't matter. She lowered her voice to a whisper. I found him. I found the Walter. You did? I was genuinely surprised at such a development. Yes. He lives on the third floor apartment 73. They told me to go hang out with him while they were deciding what to do with me. It seems like they're taking good care of him in return for his help. 
I... I don't know what's happened to the other tenants, though. He doesn't want to talk about them. So did you talk to him? Did he tell you why he did it? Why did he weld us in here? I asked with anticipation. Yes. She looked around to see if anyone could hear us. The men were still descending from the roof and going straight inside her apartment to help with the old man who was still tender to inside. He says that he panicked. He was hunting in the forest for some game when he saw them. He says that there are dozens and maybe hundreds of them. They are migrating somewhere. And we are on the sidewalk of their path. So he ran home and barricaded himself and all of us. Of course, that was before he learned about the bandits. Said they had moved in just two nights before. But why didn't he run away? I wondered. Why not evacuate? Natasha shook her head. He can't. He has a son and he is completely bedridden, paralyzed below the waist, and he's too weak to carry him. No elevators, too. She grunted and shook her head. He thought that it would all be over in a day or two, but he miscalculated. I imagine the situation the man had found himself in, trapping not only himself but his helpless child and everyone else in this hell. Even though I wanted to feel angry at him, I just couldn't. I told him about your plan. Natasha interrupted my train of thought. He says that it makes sense and he's willing to lend his tools and skills if we find a way to sneak him and his son out. They guard him well. There are constant patrols on the 4th and 2nd floor. Of course, they mostly drink and listen to music, but they have guns. I wanted to say something, but then Maxim approached Natasha and put a hand on her shoulder. You alright, girl? Yeah, I'm fine. Natasha said, leaning back. She didn't like the fire in Maxim's eyes. Good, good, he said, staring into the distance. I have a daughter, you know, younger than you, but still. He gave Natasha's shoulder another shake. They will never do this to you again, girl, he proclaimed. And I could almost hear the lava of pure anger building in his throat. Or anyone else, for that matter. I made a decision. We need to strike them first. If you have pests, you gotta smoke them out. He looked Natasha in the face and the sight of her wounds made him grit his teeth. Tomorrow, we'll burn their entire stairwell down. Right now, I barely have enough strength to write. And my memories of the events that transpired a week ago are still fuzzy. But let's just say one thing. I'm still here. Still inside this cursed building. Weaker than ever. Maxim wasn't joking that he was going to burn down the entire stairwell. I and some others tried to convince him not to do it. We reminded him that we would catch on fire as well. That there were at least two innocent people in there. One of whom was a young man who wouldn't be able to escape. But none of it mattered to him. We just have to start a fire big enough to make them move towards the roof. He said, maniacally nodding at his own words. We'll be waiting for them there. And once they emerge, he made a slashing motion with his hand. After that, we can put the fire out. You'll try to, I reminded him. Fire's no joke. Who knows how big it may grow? Well, we'll do our best. He reassured me in an impatient tone. But I wasn't going to let it slide. And what about the Walter and his son? I reminded him. They are just prisoners there, and they won't be able to escape the fire or the smoke. Are you ready to burn them down? I looked him in the eye, trying to guilt him into abandoning his idea. But Maxim didn't look away. Instead, he looked me straight in the eye, and I could see that the flames of his anger were getting wilder. How can you be so sure that they are just prisoners in there? Because they said so. Why did they make such a convenient cage door for them, huh? Why did they lock us in here? Because his son... I tried to explain, but Maxim stopped me before I could finish. No, that's just what he says. And personally, I think he's full of BS. He didn't have to lock us all in here, alright. He could have just stayed in his apartment and be done with it. So unless you have a better plan, we're going to do it my way. He said before turning around to leave. I do actually. I said to his bag. 
He turned around and nodded for me to continue talking. My plan was crazy and dangerous, potentially even more so than the one Maxim offered, and way more complicated. But in my plan, the threat could be contained, while Maxim was basically offering to burn us all down. So after listening to what I had to offer, he agreed to go with it. At least we can still burn it all down if your plan goes wrong, he grunted. You start tonight, I'll find you a few men who can assist you. If your plan doesn't work by sunrise, we go with mine. I was too anxious to stay alone, so I decided to spend the rest of the day at Natasha's place. Her apartment was crowded. A few women were helping her tend to the old man. He was breathing heavily, and his face was very pale. But his bleeding had stopped and he was conscious again. Young man, thank you, he said, wincing from pain at the same time. It was obvious that talking was causing him quite a lot of pain. I didn't do anything, I said, and frankly, that was the truth. The old man was just too confused to realize what had happened. That I had abandoned him and went after Natasha, not even bothering to call for help. But he just smiled at me. So modest. Lay still and don't waste your strength. One of the women told him, you're too weak for that. He didn't pay her words any attention. I'm sorry, young man, he whispered weakly. And to you all, I'm sorry as well. It was our hubris to expect anything else. He's delusional. Don't mind his words. One of the older ladies warned me and Natasha. For the first time in my life, I'm quite sane, thank you. The man denied with some degree of irritation before wincing from pain. Listen, he talked to me again. There's no forgiving us for what we've done. It was a difficult time. The entire world was our enemy, but still, we thought that we had failed. But we were thinking globally. We were only thinking about them as if they were weapons aimed at the enemy. We never thought they would be so effective against the civilians, against our own people if they ever broke out. We underestimated them. We thought they were already gone. Quit your old ramblings, you old fool. And you two, go. The old woman told me and Natasha. Can't you see you're agitating him? We need him to rest. This is my apartment. Natasha objected, but the woman just scowled. You'll be back here tomorrow. Go hang out at your boyfriend's place. She nodded at me. He's not my... Okay... Natasha gave in, seeing that there was no use arguing. I nodded towards the door. She nodded back and we headed out. Heed my words, there will be more. You need to get out of here while you still can, or they'll trample you along with everyone else. The last words of the old man sounded like an ominous warning. It was in the deep of night when we started executing my plan. The first thing we needed was the lure. It was tough finding a piece of meat nobody wanted to share. And when they heard of why we needed it, they would spin a finger at their temple to show us what they thought about our idea. But after a few hours of searching, we finally found what we were looking for. And then it was time for the next part of the plan. We brought it to the basement with us and headed towards the furthest door. The one that led to the stairwell Maxwell wanted to burn down so much. The door must have been locked on the hanging lock from the other side, but it was old and wooden. There was a way to get past it. The trick was to do it completely silently. We spent a good three hours trying to drill through the wood with a wimble we had borrowed from an old carpenter, making one crank at a time, listening all the while to the noises on the other side. In the complete silence, we could hear the thugs who were on Overwatch drinking and talking and the nauseating hoarse voice of chants and singing they were listening to still rings in my ears. But at any moment, the music could stop and their tone could change from cheerful to worried, which would mean only one thing. We were busted. Throughout our operation, I could think about one thing only. Our failure meant the death of the welder. 
Even if we would miraculously retrieve his tools from the ashes, that price was too high to pay. After two hours, the Wimbles drill finally reached the nail which held the lock hinge in place, and we spent the next hour working around it, taking turns, trying to make the hole bigger, until finally the nail was separated from the wood. The hanging lock was just hanging from the doorframe now, and the door could be opened. I took off my boots and I entered the stairwell. From then on, I was on my own. It only made sense for me to be the one to bear all the risks. After all, this was my plan. The men were just one floor above me. I could now hear them with perfect clarity. One wrong step, one noise, and they come rushing down towards me. It was time for the greatest gamble of my life. I reached out towards one of the doors. Unlocked, of course. Why would they lock it if they left it? They knew that the first floor was dangerous, that the ape could break down the grates on their windows. And so did I. I headed towards the kitchen, opened the window and put the piece of meat on the floor, and then carefully taking a knife out of the drawer, I slipped my left palm and drew some blood, raining a few drops onto the piece of meat. The plan was now set in motion. I didn't know how well the ape could smell, but I banked on the fact that by sunrise, it would be tempted enough to break down the grates and enter the stairwell, where it would quickly deal with all the bandits. I hoped that the old water would have enough sense to lock the doors before that happened. Looking over my trap one last time, I headed toward the exit. I made sure to leave the door open, that way, either the creature would find its way out of the apartment on its own, or the bandits would hear it breaking in which would prompt them to come over and take a look at what was going on and drawing it out. I headed towards the basement door, only to find it wide open. The hammer nails and pieces of furniture, improvised wooden planks that we planned to use to barricade the door afterward, were lying right next to it, abandoned. Weird, I thought to myself before I heard it. The pitter-patter of many legs that was getting closer with each second, coming straight out of the basement that I came from. The windows was all I could think before I turned around and ran. The windows, the tiny windows that had lined the walls of the basement, were an easy way for the crawler to get in. We had never seen it, so we had no clue whether it would be able to sneak in. And now it was in there, cutting me off from safety and pitting me between a rock and a hard place. And it was approaching fast. I didn't have a lot of time to spare. I had two options. Run back into the apartment that I had just left, where the bait was waiting for the ape. Or run up the stairs towards the bandits and hope that their shooting skills weren't great. I chose the second option. In a crisis, the primates had always thought to gain elevated position or move towards their peers. And that instinct, buried deep within my psyche, re-emerged in the time of need. The men were so drunk and so bewildered by my sudden appearance that none of them had even reached for their gun. They just watched me with surprised eyes as I rushed past them towards the third floor, toward the apartment 73. Open up! I shouted as I started furiously banging on the door. I'm Natasha's friend, open up! One floor below me, the man screamed in terror. One of the screams was cut short as a pair of muddy jaws maybe mandibles, crushed the man's throat. A second later, I heard gunshots. The men above, the ones who guarded the fourth floor, started rushing down to see what was going on. I could hear their hurried steps. In a second, they would turn around the corner and see me, trying to break into their most important prisoner's apartment. The key clanked and the door suddenly bulged. I jumped to the side to let it open, and saw the old man inside, wrinkly face, wide eyes. Hey, who the heck are you? I heard right behind me. They were just one flight of stairs away. I pushed the old man aside. I jumped inside his apartment, locking the door behind me and listened. They had rushed past the door. There were more pressing matters to take care of, one floor below. I'm Natasha's friend. I've come here to rescue you. Grab your metal saw or a gas torch or whatever it is that you have and let's go. I quickly said. But I... He tried to interrupt me, but I stopped him with a gesture. 
I'll carry your son, don't worry about it. I don't have a gas torch anymore, he said. I shook my head. I couldn't have heard it right. What? I asked him. I'm out of gas. I used it all up cutting the railings for the cage on the roof, he explained. So, you don't have anything to cut through metal? I inquired. It seemed impossible. No, no, that, that couldn't be right. He shook his shoulders. I'm afraid not. But you told Natasha that you have the tools. I roared at him. I do, but they're useless. I, I just wanted to save my son, he explained, pointing towards the door to the other room. I just wanted someone to carry him out of here. He didn't have the tools. My quest for him was pointless. I slid down the door and I grabbed my head. I spent a few minutes like that, listening to the noises outside. The men rushed back to the fourth floor, shooting at their pursuer. And after a few minutes, the sounds of a fight and struggle above stopped. I had to get out. I had no reason to stay here any longer. Should any of the bandits survive, they would come over to see who I was. I opened the door. Wait, you're leaving? But I can't carry him without you. The old man pleaded. Please, I just... I walked out and I closed the door behind him. I moved back to the basement carefully, yet at the same time, I couldn't feel any more fear. It all seemed pointless at that moment. In two weeks, I had harbored hope that I would be able to get out through the sewers. And now, all hope was lost. The second floor had two corpses on it. One of them still clutching a pistol. I wasn't thinking about my survival at that moment, but I thought that it could still come in handy in the future. I grabbed the gun and pulled it, only to realize that the hand holding it was not yet dead. The man I thought to be dead opened his eyes and looked at me. He was too weak to form words, but he had enough strength to form a scowl. He recognized me. He knew it was me who let the crawler in. A shot rang, and I tumbled down the flight of stairs, clutching my side. The pain instantly snapped me back to reality, my survival instincts coming back online. I wanted to live. I wanted to live no matter how bleak my future looked. What if the crawler heard it? What if something else heard it? I'm losing blood. I need to hurry. My brain was producing one rushed thought after another. I descended into the basement, squeezing my wound. I could barely see in the darkness, but luckily, I was alone in there. I pulled the handle of the door that led to my stairwell. Nothing. I pulled at it again. It still didn't budge. It wasn't that I was too weak to open it. It was locked. I looked back at the windows lining the wall and I knocked on the door. I was too scared to shout for someone to open. I knocked again and I heard some noises. But they weren't coming from the other side of the door. They were coming from the apartment where I had left the bait. It seemed that the ape finally took it. I heard its roar, heard the noise with which the grates were separated from the wall, and I shuddered. I had nowhere to run. I was cornered. If it could smell the blood on me, I could feel that my palm was full of blood, and there was probably a trail of blood drops behind me. My only hope was that it would be drawn towards the bloodbath on the second floor. I sat down near the door and I closed my eyes. There was no point in staying alert. If anything, I had to make sure I would make as few sounds as possible. The sounds were starting to get quiet. The last thing I heard was its footsteps as it entered the stairwell and sniffed the air. That's where I was found in the morning, lying unconscious from all the blood loss right next to the door. Thankfully, someone had found me before I had froze to death, otherwise you wouldn't be reading this. Throughout the last week, I was trying to recover my strength. Nakasha was taking good care of me, and thankfully, she found a penicillin somewhere, so I didn't have to worry about infections. It did a trick on my digestive system, though, which was less than ideal in my situation. The bullet had went clean through, though there were two wounds on me. At least they didn't have to cut it out. I'm starting to regain my strength bit by bit, but with our limited food sources, it was tough. In fact, we're going to run out of food in just a few days.
The tenants pulled all their food and started rationing it. A surprising development for sure. But very soon, uh, there will be none left. I heard that some men were trying to raid nearby grocery stores. Not all of them returned. They hope that once I recover, I'll join them. I can't object to that. They had been feeding me for the last week after all. But I can't help but think that we need to get out. Once the food runs out, we'll be too weak to do that. So, uh, my next update will probably be the last one. Sorry for not writing for so long. It just seemed pointless for the longest time, but I guess I have to say goodbye. It would be impolite to do otherwise. Little by little, I'm beginning to walk. The strength has been coming back very slowly to me, ounce by ounce. With my poor diet, my body had to cannibalize some muscle tissue in order to heal the wound. It's going to leave an ugly scar too. Right now, I have a hole in my side filled to the brim with scar tissue. I can't help but poke it all the time, even though it's disgusting. Of course, I won't be going for any food raids anytime soon. I might be able to descend down the rope, but to climb back up while carrying a dozen kilos of food on me, that's just impossible. I'll repeat the fate of that old man who couldn't get back inside. So for the past week, I've been lying in bed in Natasha's apartment. I guess you could say it's become a hospital of sorts. She takes care of both me and the old man. One boiled potato per day for each of us. She's been boiling them all while using the same pot of water. Says it'll make a nice soup when we're out of everything else. Maxim and the other men try to raid the local grocery stores nearby. But each raid gets more difficult than the last. Mostly because half of the time somebody doesn't return. They would take the guns that they had found in the bandit's hideout. But from what I've been told, they're not much use, and the gunshots usually imply that something is living out there last seconds in terror. I don't hear much about the outside except for some rumors. Before I was locked inside the apartment complex, but now it feels like the danger lurks right beyond the door's threshold, beyond our windows. It feels like my fortress that used to be the whole building shrunk to fit inside Natasha's apartment. And with my limited mobility, I can't feel safe outside of her apartment. We're almost out of food. I can hear people bickering with each other more and more. It seems to head in a nasty direction. And each time Natasha steps out of her apartment, I fear that she might not return. She says that crazy things go on outside. The things that just a month or even two weeks ago would make my hair stand up. But now I'm just too tired and exhausted with all this BS to react. I feel like the same goes for everyone else in the building. Natasha says that a mysterious human figure has been spotted right in the very, very verge of the forest. It signaled to the observers to come out and follow it, and then disappeared in the forest. It seemed impossible for it to be one of these survivors. On another day, the tenants from one of the apartments started screaming that their voices in their heads were too loud. I would believe that it was just madness taking it over if it was just one person. But all three of them, that was just very unlikely. After a few nights before, we all woke up from the stampede. Hundreds of legs were rushing from the forest, past our house and into the town. I could feel the building tremble from vibrations, their mighty feet were sending into the ground, and these screeches of many beasts were mixing together, to a point where it was hard to tell which one I had heard before. No one dared look out the window. We were all just hoping that they had all passed and let us continue living on our pointless lives. After they had passed, we could hear gunshots firing off in the distance throughout the whole next day. The sounds of shots got the old man quite agitated. I never managed to get more than a few coherent sentences at a time out of him. It seems that the physical toll of his body as well as whatever guilt he's been feeling has made him lose it a bit by bit. He talked about a place far in the forest. He was confusing things so I'm not quite sure what it was. In some stories, it's a town and in others, a base in the forest. Sometimes it's a lab and sometimes an archaeological dig. It was built by the Soviets and it's been there long ago. 
But in all stories, one word always came up. The door. He had worked there as an intern. He says that our entire town was built by the Soviets precisely because of that location. It was a closed off town though, one that wasn't on any maps, even on the secret ones. Our town was a place where all these scientists and personnel lived. He said that he got his apartment back when he was assigned to the project and was very proud of being a homeowner at a young age. Whatever they had been doing there, the higher ups ended up disappointed with the results. So the project was closed and the town was declassified even before the fall of the Union. He said that he had forgotten what he had seen there until a month ago. But now, despite decades of abandonment, something was happening there again. Something that unleashed the hordes of these monsters. As the man himself said it, Something on the other side has finally made contact with us. Forty years after we sent out our first signal, he didn't elaborate on what the other side was, or where the beasts were coming from in such volume. Soon after, he shut himself off from the world around him, and he wouldn't talk anymore. Two days ago, the mysterious figure was back again, and this time, I got a good look at it. A long black winter jacket with a hood that obscured its face. A dark spot, so clearly visible on the snow. I say it because, despite it looking completely human, I can't accept it as such. The only thing different was that, on that day, some people had followed it into the woods. I was almost one of them. The voice that I had heard in my head was just too alluring to ignore. Yesterday, it came back again and once more, with a wave of its hand, people started crawling out of windows to follow it. Some were just hanging over rails and falling down into the snow from the second floor, before getting up and following its call, ignoring the cold and broken appendages. I had to restrain Natasha from following it. It seems that some people are more susceptible to its call, and so she answered it. I was fighting her for a good five minutes. She didn't hit or bite me. She was just silently pushing with her whole body towards the door, trying to get out of the building and follow it. I was shouting at her, even hitting her to bring her back to her senses, all the while feeling the strength leave my already weakened body. And throughout all that, I could almost feel the creature's awaiting gaze, piercing through these solid walls and judging me looking over Natasha, disapproving that she was making its way for her. Finally, it left, and Natasha came back to her senses. I almost burst out crying when I realized that she was back with me. Over the last few weeks, she had become the closest person to me, almost like a sister. To see her back to her senses was a great relief. But then the chill, cold air passed us, and with the terror, we realized that we were the only two people left in the apartment. The old man left and he didn't bother to close the window behind him. Seeing as it was the fifth floor, we didn't risk looking out to see if he'd survived. We knew the answer. We simply closed the window. Today, the mysterious figure, the haunted Pied Piper, will undoubtedly return. And this time, we all may fall victim to his call. So, we have no choice but to abandon the ship. There are no more than ten people left in the building, and we're all ready to leave. We've eaten all the food we've had, there's no point in carrying it on us anymore. We put on the warmest clothes we've had to combat winter, and we've all prepared the makeshift weapons. Some sharpen their brooms, but I decided to stick with my hatchet. I'm still convinced that it's the best weapon I have. We're leaving in five minutes, and Natasha's pouring potato soup into cups. Our last meal in this building. We don't know where we'll go and how far we'll get, but I'm sure of one thing. We'll be safer away from the forest. We might even travel from one building to another. After all, we doubt the people closed their apartments before evacuating. So who knows, we might survive. We'll head somewhere far away, away from the military, away from the creatures. I'm sure we'll find a way. And if in the future, I'm not maimed or shot, and I finally have a moment to sit down and safely recount what I've been through, I'll let you all know. So, keep your fingers crossed for me, and hopefully, I'll talk to you soon.